Holality is a spiritual bio psychological approach. The trauma in the body is just a wound. It's a physiological state. It can be healed. When we honor the body, honor the nervous system, honor the, the body as a, as a filter, perpetually transmuting this divine energy of life. We're actually doing four webinars. This is the very first one. This webinar is really looking at trauma and how kind of in a sense, it's not just a thought. There's, it, there's something bigger behind it. So we're gonna be talking about that. Um, and then next week, we're gonna be talking a completely different thing. We're gonna be talking about the power of two. Oh yeah. Our energetic potential to literally bend space time <laughs> now, now that sounds completely nuts um but with holality or the wholeness of the holality of life it's very broad so this webinar is just very specifically zoomed into a part of the whole but ex but yeah <clears throat> zoomed into a to a part but expresses in every aspect of your exactly life. it does so um, if you haven't been on the webinar before, um, we generally do them in 45 minutes, but this is a much bigger topic. We've had lots of questions about this. So we're going to present for around 50, five, zero minutes. We're going to have a break. And then in the break, if your questions weren't answered or if you want to leave a comment, please put it in the chat during the break time. And then we're going to come back. And then we're going to kind of go through any comments or questions or responses Ooh. that you guys have. So ask the questions in the break time. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I mean, via the chat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, because you may well have a question and we may well answer it kind of as we go through. Now, you have to bear with us as a bit of disclaimer, because um, we often spend six months on our facilitator training, unpacking this bit by bit and going in and in, in an in as an embodied way with our students, we're trying to squeeze it into 50, five, zero minutes. So um, we're gonna do the best we can, um, but the thing is with understanding or, or knowledge is um, if you don't explain it right, people think they've got what it is that you're saying and often they don't, because it needs to be a deeper insightful embodiment. So we're gonna do the best we can. So on this webinar, we're going to be talking about, well, what is trauma? How it's stored in the body? What effect it has and why? And how to move through that. So you may not be interested in the first three and more interest in the last one. So to answer the last one, how to move through, you kind of really need to understand all the first ones first. So just stay with us throughout the whole thing. And again, I would recommend that there's going to be a lot in this webinar. <clears throat> so because you guys subscribed, you're going to get the recording. So I recommend that you re-watch this recording after this finishes. OK. So. Where do you want to start, honey? I guess I want to talk about um, the definition of trauma. OK, sure. So the definition of trauma in, in my experience, um, experientially, is not an outside circumstance. It's our body's response to the outside circumstance. So like in nursing, um, being an ER nurse, generalize, if somebody has experienced something that was really quite traumatic, that it's going to have an equal effect on every single person and that's not necessarily the case and I hope that makes sense does that make sense yeah it's not the whatever happened it's the it's the very real very very visceral response the physiological response that's occurring in the moment and so I want to honor it there because this is how this is how we've helped people yeah um quick story so as many of you know i've i've taught a particular understanding for, for a very very long time in fact i've been learning all manner of different things like teaching mindfulness spiritual healing nlp etc etc since i was 21 so that's 30 years and during that time 
um, I've noticed, and many of you are, you know, practicing some form of understanding modality to help others as well. So I don't know if you can relate to this, but sometimes you'd have clients or students and there'll be this big expansion or acceleration, they'll, they'll feel better. Um, but then there can be a regression. Mm. Um, mm. Hands up who's experienced that within their own practice or teaching or whatever you do. Yeah. yeah. Um, sometimes you have people and it's really slow going. It's, there is progress, but it can kind of take a longer time than other people. So being a facilitator, I've had quite mediocre results, to be quite honest, with, with a lot of people. But also, when I look at my contemporaries also running facilitator trainings and coach trainings, what we get is we get their students coming to us. And then in the past, our students went to them and people bounced around between all these different teachers. Um. In fact, give us a hands up if you're one of those people who's bounced around a bit doing different trainings, different certifications, different, yeah. So there's this bouncing going around. And when we started looking at the wholeness of being, and we can't really go into that now because I want to keep it specific around trauma, from what I've heard from my students, they're kind of saying that, that it, the search is over, not that they've gained enlightenment, but they've, I've got the whole picture and they keep going deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper than the wholeness. They stop going to lots of other things and bouncing around. And part of the results, well, why that is, is because of this specific aspect that we're going to be talking about now in, in the wholeness. And it is different from what I used to teach. I used to teach as you guys probably know that everything is 100% thought created. Okay. Now, <clears throat> another question for you guys, have you ever taught something and you were so certain about it, then at some stage you kind of had a bit of a revelation or seeing things differently or understanding differently. And then you couldn't teach what you used to teach hands up. Who's ever experienced that? Yeah, perfect. Okay, so that's kind of what happened with me. I, I couldn't teach what I used to teach because a seeming absolute 100% certainty that I was utterly convinced to be true and was utterly convinced for like 20 years just dissolved. And Part of the reason it dissolved is what we're going to be talking about today. And, and again, this is a big topic. We unpack this over months with people. We're going to do our absolute best to try and simplify into a very short space of time. So. <clears throat> OK, so I'm going to just say something, then can you take over, honey? Yeah, yeah. Because Jules is the expert here. Um. Okay, so events happen in life. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a diagram. <laughs> so <clears throat> there's an event that happens in life. Okay, now it could be a pretty extreme event. It could be rape. It could be violence. It could be something really unpleasant. Or it could be the fact that you're not allowed to show your emotions. It could be that you feel that you're invisible. Like whatever it is, I'm just going to call that an event in time with people, places and things. Okay. Now that event will leave. And this is just my word. Um, I'm going to call it a footprint. You could call that um, a, you call it a neural groove. Like there's, you know, when you walk on sand on the beach, if it's a little bit wet, you leave a footprint in the sand. Now your foot hasn't damaged the sand. Okay. 
And it doesn't actually mean anything about the sand, but it leaves an imprint. Are you with me so far? Okay. So an event leaves a footprint in our whole beingness. Okay. And then what happens is presently taken with you, even though the event is now in the past. Now, again, I have to say, I'm not saying what kind of a footprint or that there has to be a footprint because everyone's uniquely different. I'm just saying that past events, especially what we could define as traumatic events, leaves a footprint. Now, the question could be, well, OK, let's let's call this footprint trauma. And we're going to talk you're going to talk more about what that means, because, again, everyone has a different opinion of what trauma means. But this takes an unpleasant sensation. OK. Um, even though the event is gone. That footprint is presently with you and will presently get triggered by stimulus of a similar nature. That's the first point. And the second point, and then we go to Jules, is you could ask, well, how can trauma be trapped in the body? And Jules is going to explain that more from a physiological. I'm going to exchange, I'm going to explain it from a different perspective. Yeah, like your perspective. <clears throat> um so hands up. Who here disagrees? So only put your hand up if you disagree. Who here disagrees that we're not? spiritual or energetic beings okay we are i use the word spiritual another word i could say is energetic energy we are energy beings well guess what energy has been well known for hundreds of years to store information energy is basically a wave of information Sid called it, we live in a universe of knowledge. Greg Braden calls it the field of, what's he call it? The divine matrix, like the <laughs> matrix of information. Yeah. Everyone's got their own words. But fundamentally, energy is a vibration of information. So you could ask, how can, you know, like a past event create trauma presently in the body from, from an energetic perspective? And you're going to do the physiology in a minute. We can't not because we are energy beings and energy is information. Okay. Does that make sense, guys? Give us a head nod if that makes sense. Okay. okay. So it's not physically located as a thing. It's a vibration. It's a frequency in our body. Okay. Anyway, over to you, honey. Um, I wanted to give a little bit of history that I thought was kind of exciting. So back in 1890, William James, he proposed, he brought to Harvard, he proposed that emotions follow a pre-existing physiological state. He brought this to Harvard to the very stuffy professors and um, they poo-pooed it. They said that we shouldn't be looking at emotions, I'm paraphrasing, we shouldn't be looking at emotions in the body as they are animalistic and vile. We should pay more attention to what's going up here, you know, in the in the brain, in the cognition. Well, uh, he didn't listen, and he, I, I would like you guys to look this up. So it's called the James Lang theory, and it was presented in 1890, and it's the theory of emotions. And he points to a bottom up experience that the emotions begin here they arise through feelings and then out pops a more clear defined cognition um and then in 1906 sir charles sherrington coined the term interoception and what interoception is is the way that your body communicates to you it's a gift of communication. It communicates via uh, via sensory organs, the heart, the liver, mm -hmm. the intestines. So it's always telling a story, but it's telling a somatic story below cog cognitive awareness. Yeah, soma meaning body. Yeah. And so it, there isn't a clear language. But he, again, was pointing to that uh, it arises prior to cognition. Um. And then 
which I love, Walter Rudolph Hess in 1949 won a Nobel Prize for his work on an unbroken unity, um, meaning we are one system. There is no mind-body connection because it's it's an unbroken unity. It begins from the bottom and it goes up to the top and back down again. And um, so that's something else you can look at. And then my favorite, one of my favorites is Dr. Anthony DiMazio. He wrote a book called Descartes' Error. He took all of William James' research and proved it. And that's what, that's, what really we're going to be talking about today, as well as Dr. Stephen Porges's work. Um, we look at experience within plurality as a, as a bottom-up experience. The experience begins in the sensory organs. Um, and then that those sensory organs, although a vague language, they're communicating to you all the time. And if the, if the energy gets too overwhelming, we have bodily responses that actually keep it, uh, keep it kind of locked down, would you say? We have muscles in our physical body, like the, I'll just, um, they're muscles around the heart. The technical term is the transversus thoracic muscles, the diaphragm, the, um, the thoracic inlet. And all of these do a job if we have some sort of trauma, meaning too much emotions too soon or developmental trauma, which, which can mean too little love, too little, too little co-regulation, too little, how would you describe that? Yeah, co-regulation meaning, um, you know, empathy, touch, mm -hmm. you know, that, that connection with another human being. Yeah. Trauma doesn't have to be a big, uh, horrific event. It can be literally the lack of mm -hmm. empathy. Right. And so as Rudy was talking, it leaves an imprint in the body. Uh, it leaves a, a sustained physiological state of threat. And so we know about stress. So we know that the stress response from the adrenals on the back of the, of the kidneys spout out all of these stress hormones. And we know that that can be harmful in, to the body. But a lot, I'd say 90% of, of these humans you know, walking around the earth are experiencing a prolonged stress response, which is a chronic, a chronic state of stress. <sighs> thank you for having an open mind. And thank you for listening. Mm -hmm. Because I know this bottom up experience is kind of new. It's yeah. new to us, although it's been trying to make its way into the medical books into the psychology books for years but it just hasn't made it yet. Right. So I'm going to introduce you to some new words. Um, I'm going to, so my students know who this is. Her name is Sally. And so I use Sally a lot, Sally with no arms because her arms get in the way. So I use Sally a lot to explain our experience. And in 19, what, oh, I'm so sorry. Don't, Dr. Porges introduced the polyvagal theory, which kind of encompasses everything that I've talked about and proved it even more and has offered a space for healing, a space to reawaken your body, a space to give you the sense that you exist, you wholly exist, wholly with a W, that you belong, it's understanding your place in the world. Mm. I mean, it just provides so much healing and, and I cannot scream it enough from the mountaintops. So I want to talk about how Sally here experiences the world around her. Mm -hmm. So I know I, I introduced the bottom up, you know, the interoception ignites perception. There's one other and that is. Neuroception. Neuroception. Neuroception is your body's surveillance system. There are neuroreceptors all over your body, outside and in, that they're, they're um, constantly scanning the universe, the universe, the, the world around you. It's constantly scanning and it's detecting anything that may be a threat. So when 
when a child pre-verbal experiences something that may be quite um, quite a shock to their physiological system, mm -hmm. that could ignite a chronic state of threat in their body. So I, I talk about that because I don't necessarily bring people back to the traumatic event because a lot of times we don't know what it is. A lot of times it's something that happens pre-verbal and it makes an imprint, as Rudy said, and you carry that imprintation with you and your body is in a heightened state of threat. So it's going to send out receptors and receive anything that could be a threat. So Sally here has had that happen to her. It's happened to her pre-verbal and now it's resting in her implicit memory. And I wanna explain what implicit memory is. There's implicit memory and there's explicit memory. I'm just gonna talk about those two right now. So implicit memory, implicit memory is, um, is your body's way of responding to something below cognitive awareness. It is, you can like tie in your shoe, mm -hmm. that's implicit memory. So you can tie your shoe and I can have a conversation with Azra, with, with, with Ursula right now, while I'm tying my shoe. So I'm using my implicit memory to tie the shoe and my explicit memory, which is recall, to have a conversation. And so this is important. So when Sally's going through life, her body received a shock to the system. The implicit memory now has adapted a response. And that adaptive response is, is what carries her and heroically keeps her body safe. So anytime that she senses any threat, or excuse me, anytime that her nervous system senses any threat, she's going to get a, a spout of cortisol in her system. She's going to get, she's going to get the sensation of uneasiness. Something is not quite right. That doesn't mean that there's something dangerous in the world. That just means that her body senses something dangerous. Mm -hmm. We can use you and the barking dogs. Yeah. So, um, so, um, I mean, I won't go into details, but um, so when I was growing up, there was alcoholism, there's violence, mental health issues, th there's lots of bullying. I mean, um, there was just lots of physical threats in my my world as I was growing up. Um, and so I kind of, my nervous system mm. adapted in a sense to become what I could call empathic. I could very much feel the sense, room. I yeah. could kind of like sense things um, that many people wouldn't be able to sense because my yeah my nervous system became very in tune and attuned to picking up information just because of my physical safety and so what happens is my nervous system which i only later discovered later with jules has been in this almost constant state of high alert most of my adult life um and one of the ways I realized this was um, if there's those Harley Davidsons with kind of noise or if there's barking dogs for some reason, like we walk past the neighbors and the dogs are barking and I literally, I'm not exaggerating, I find it painful. Like I feel, I mean, I literally want to cry. It's a I mean, visceral. It's a very visceral response with me. I want to cry and often... I have to hold my ears walking past the barking dogs when a uh, one of those amazing you know Harley Davidsons go past with the low rumble it just it's like splinters in my soul for me so can you explain yeah. why so this doesn't mean that everybody that has auditory um sensitivity which Rudy is expressing is is, you know, it doesn't mean if you have auditory sensitivity that that's exactly what's going on. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that the physiological state has an expression and can be expressed in that way. And I'll, I'll explain why it's really quite, it's really quite fascinating. And it's really beautiful how divinely designed we are mm. as humans, whole humans. So 
what's going on? We have, oh, please forgive me, my carumba. <laughs> I'm trying to draw an ear. Okay, so, um, okay, so I'll just draw an ear like this. There we go. And then there's the, there's the outside of the ear. So everybody has a middle ear. And in the middle ear, you've got something called a tympanic membrane, which is, we call an eardrum. So in a heightened state of alert, in a, in a, in a chronic state of threat, your body is so amazing mm -hmm. that it's going to send out these receptors to scan the environment. What it does is it changes the shape of your tympanic membrane. Literally, physiologically. Literally, yes. So it changes the shape from flat, which is, you know, which is you, you're, you're easy, able to hear human voice, you're um, communicative, you know, you, you're kind of having a pleasing physiological experience. But in a state of threat, your tympanic membrane, here, I'll use a different color. I'll use green. Change of shape. It curves. And so what that does because it's heroically attempting to keep you safe, it scouts for anything that could be a lower vibration, like a growl of a, of a lion or a higher vibration, like a squeal of an animal. It tunes out human voice. So Rudy wasn't listening to a thing I was saying, or this was, this was our experience. I was like, why are you not listening to me? Did you hear what I said? And he's just like, he, he yeah, I didn't have the capacity. He to, didn't have yeah. The, yeah, he didn't have the capacity to hear human voice because his body was in a state of attempting to keep him safe. I want to kind of give another example. So let's say you're driving and um, and it's a sunny day. And then all of a sudden clouds come and it's, oh, I had a dream about this last night. Yeah. Um, and it starts hailing and you're, you're driving and you've got the radio playing. How many of you reached over and turned down the radio so you could see better? I mean, that response, like you immediately turn down the radio. So you're, what happens is you're experiencing a, a threatening experience. Your nervous system is experiencing a threatening experience. Your body is now tuned in to anything that may seem threat threatening. So that person talking on the radio becomes quite annoying. Human voice becomes quite annoying. And so mm -hmm. I wanted to explain that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So so you guys, we should see if this. Are you guys with me so far? Just yeah, give us a head nod if it's making sense. Okay. Okay. Okay, cool. Okay, so now neuroception. Neuroception is your body survey, your, excuse me, sorry, Dr. Porges, your, your nervous system's surveillance system all over the body. Oh, thank you. Um, so it's all over the body. There's neuroreceptors in your skin, in your sense, in your, in your smell, in your ears that we explained around your eyes. So um, it's receiving information um 24 7. okay so let's see here rudy well you can stay there so the neuroception like i said where's the black so neuroception gives way to interoception there's a whole beautiful being dialogue that's going on Neuroception is communicating from the environment to your body. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about just this one physiological state, which is the state of threat. So it's a threat response. And Sally has a heightened threat response because of what happened and what occurred before she had higher cortical functions, before she had the thinking brain, before she had implicit, or excuse me, explicit memory, she had, you know, we're born with, with um, implicit memory receivers, but her higher cortical functions were very, very primitive at this point. So she's carrying this heightened state around with her. And like Rudy, we can just say she has auditory hypersensitivity or, or you know, the, the dog barking creates more of a 
threat response in her body. So that gives way to interoception. And then I call this the printout. And I actually do this with my clients. So perception, so the cognitive story that's going on. So when Sally is experiencing a heightened state of threat, all of her energy, all of the nutrients, everything is going to be going to the muscles. It's going to be going to the, the transverse thoracics, like I told you, the, the thoracic inlet that's right here is going to close down. The muscles behind the neck are going to tighten. So Sally could be experiencing gastroenteritis. She's good, she could be experiencing irritable bowels. She could be experiencing back pain. She could ex be experiencing a sense that her heart isn't open. And she could also be experiencing sort of brain fog. This brain fog is because our thinking brain during this moment goes offline. Mm -hmm. So it goes offline. But this is a divine design. We don't want our thinking brain to be on. We want, because our body is sensing, our nervous system is sensing threat, we need to be on high alert. We need to have, um, you know, catecholamines, which is our, our adrenaline pumped through our body so we can run and run away from the monster that's, that our nervous system believes is going to get us. It's like an instantaneously automatic reaction. Mm -hmm. Like I remember when I did tree surgery when I was younger, um, the ladder collapsed and I fell quite far. And um, I didn't think, oh, look, I'm falling to the ground. Oh, that's a pretty flower. <laughs> I, I immediately hunched up and I did this break roll. Jedi. Um, as I fell because I did karate at the time and I was fine. I didn't break anything, but I, I wasn't thinking I'm going to do a break roll. There was just this bodily automatic reaction. And I know all of you have an experience, something physical. You just find yourself doing something mm -hmm. like the body's doing something. Right. Uh, put your hands up if if that's you, if you've experienced that yourself. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not so in a sense, when you say this heroic attempt to protect you, yeah. what's happening is your body's literally cutting off higher cortical function of reason and analysis and overthinking things on purpose. Right. So your body can respond instantaneously in the best way it can survive. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. So when this becomes chronic, it's, it's a inner physiological state that gives way to sort of disheartening emotions. There's a sense of a heartache. There's a sense mm -hmm. of a gut wrenching pain. There's a sense of you know, you've got pain. Somebody is easily becomes a pain in the neck. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but, but you carry this around with you and, and you go to work, you come home, you do your, you do your job, but there's a, a disappearing sense of self. And this is, this is something that's really important because when we have that whole body experience, I, I talk about the cognition the printout, you know, the thoughts that come up from that space, they don't define us. They are indicators. They reveal, they point to an inner physiological presence. They point to something that's going on inside of us. So did you want to add anything to that? No, just that when, when we say bottom up, we've already explained it. We literally mean that research has found 80 to 95% okay. of all information travels this way from the body up to cognition and the current paradigm is what i would call cognitive centric but it's all about thought all about cognition all about thinking and <clears throat> when you miss the body in your whole experience like I'll, I'll do a personal example so um i have been teaching a cognitive biased understanding for a while, as you guys probably know, um, and it depends on your perspective of what you think thought is or means. But let's just take the limited perspective and thought as cognition, as thought in the head. Um, I could get really irritable very quickly. I could experience fits of anger. I could experience 
I didn't know them, but my body could respond in certain situations and I could just completely lose my higher corporal functioning and just like freak out. Saying that it's just thought didn't help because thought is an after effect. Thought is telling you what state your body in is in most of the time. Yeah. I mean, that's not wholly true, but it's mostly true. So all of these behavioral responses I had from being in high alert from the imprintation, um, they just, just triggered all of my adult life. Yeah. And when I understood, when I included the body in the nature of experience, when I understood why I was reacting like I was reacting and I went into the body, we're not going to do this right now, but communed with my whole nature, that stuff started with a W, started <laughs> falling away because the problem wasn't my thinking about a something. The problem wasn't I wasn't understanding where my experience was coming from. My thinking was a side effect of my physiological state in the moment. I couldn't help it. And many people... Okay, so for you guys, have you ever found yourself reacting or getting really hurt or really irritable or very aggressive very quickly? And while you're doing it, part of you is going, whoa, I'm yeah. calm down. What, what am I doing? Have, has anyone ever experienced that before? Yeah. This is, in a sense, is this bodily response coming up and then you thinking about it later. This bodily response, and then you analyze it with your thought later. Thought is fundamentally telling you what's going on. It's before. Often it's not causal. It's an implication. It's a side effect. It's a byproduct of experience coming through the physiology. Yeah, that's what Anthony DiMazio, um, he took all of William James. What William James, so... Uh, back then tried to go to a cognitive centric uh, philosophy at Harvard and and again poo-pooed him. I just think he's such an amazing man, way ahead of his time. But Anthony DiMazio took all that information and, and showed that the, the, of course, we have these sensory receptors in, in our inter internal organs and it has to go through the feeling centers of the brain in order for there to be a cognitive thought. So that's the somatic marker theory. Can I do one other example? Sure. Um, so our son, Seth, we just got him back after being with his stepdad. There was lots of very difficult and challenging circumstances happening with our, with our son. I get emotional thinking about it. Anyway, when we got him back, um, he was on so high alert. He was, on, he was in such a state of scanning for threat that you could walk into his room and just say kind of softly, oh, Seth, and he'll, yeah. he'll jump. Like walking down a corridor, if I opened a door, he would jump. Like his body is attuned for threat responses because he was in a very difficult circumstance. So like he's not, he's not he's thinking about it. He's not consciously doing that. Like he's not thinking there's a person I'm going to be frightened. Right. He's reacting from an intrinsic bodily response that is there to protect him, to keep him safe. A lot of people have these automatic responses from their footprints, and then they blame themselves for doing it because they should just know it's their thinking. And I, and I taught that. I taught that for years. And, and I, yeah, I it's to, not that simple. No, it's deeper than that. We would we would not survive as a human uh, species. We would not survive as a human species, if we had to think about everything before our behavior. This is life-saving behavior. This is a life-saving heroic attempt for our body to keep our, ourselves safe. Sorry to interrupt you. No, you me. go ahead. Um, I don't remember where it was. Oh, sorry. I was just giving more examples. Um, so you talked about implicit and explicit okay. memories. Yes. Okay. So now, so I'm not saying that 
all of your migraines are caused by this. What I'm yeah. saying is this offers a space for migraines to be presented. It offers a space for pain in the body. Pain is a threat response. Pain. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, pain is a is a threat response. It's it's something that arises and it's so uncomfortable. Like prior to my experience, I was dying, literally. I had a gastroenterologist, a cardiologist, a, a pain therapist, a psychologist, a urologist, and I think there was a couple more ologists, but I was very much compartmentalized. I, they looked at me from a cognitive, you know, a, a cognitive point of view and compartmentalized all these different things that were expressing in my body when um, really it was my physiological state. I was in a chronic state of threat. Mm -hmm. So, um, and you'll see my experience in that chronic state of threat, I would have to kind of rise, rise above it because I had to go to work, I had to do this, I had to pay the bills. And then I would be purely exhausted, physically exhausted, physical pain, migraines, et cetera. And then I would go back up again and try to stay above it so I could I don't know, please the doctor, doctors, my worry, my worry was that they were going to look at this. I, I didn't want to tell them anything and tell me I was bipolar. I had wisdom enough to not share any more with them. I think I shared too much because they came and took my son and that's, and that's where he was. He was with his biological father. Um, I'm just going to call him a sperm donor, but she's calling that. So <laughs> he was with that person who didn't treat him very well. And we got him back. And now we're all one big, beautiful family. But I want to scream this from the mountaintops. If you are experiencing anything like this, look deeper. Your thoughts don't define you. They do not create. In fact, beautiful William James said that in He's talked about the emotions arising from a pre-existing physiological state. I'm paraphrasing. And he said, if you were to think a thought and not have that pre-existing physiological state, it would be nothing more, and these are his words, than a flat facsimile. Mm -hmm. And so, again, I, I, I can't recommend enough. Um, Dr. Anthony DiMazio's book, Descartes Error, all of this stuff. Can I do my dice yeah. and everything? So, okay. So, when you look at our wholeality, our wholeness, okay, we are, okay, when it, when I go really zoomed out to the zoomed in, we are fundamentally, and I'm so sorry if you don't like the word, we are fundamentally God or the universe or this infinite field of energy physicaling or humaning or the universe humaning okay we are spiritual energetic beings boundaryless we're also and concurrently biochemical physiological beings we're concurrently have behaviors we have psychology we have cognition now one isn't more spiritual than the other it's we're all of it it's like Einstein said when he came up with general relativity, he said that energy and matter are not two separate things. They're the same thing. Mm. And he says, I know it's hard to understand how two, how seemingly two things can be one concurrently. It's an unfamiliar concept for the average mind, he termed it. It followed from the special theory of relativity that mass and energy are food, are but different manifestations of the same thing. A somewhat unfamiliar conception for the average mind. This is how we can be pure freaking consciousness, limitless beings. And 
physiological beings stuck in time, space and matter. OK, so we're all of it. So when we take our wholeness, spiritual, energetic, biochemical, behavioral, psychologically, many understandings try to take this wholeness and filter it through thought. You can't do it. It's like having sticking an elephant in a matchbox. We are bigger. We are broader. We are more whole. You have to include this specific webinar is only a tiny aspect of the whole, but this one, we're just talking here, really, biochemical, the body, include body in experience. Because again, research has shown 80 to 95% of all information is coming from your body up to your head, to your cognition, okay? And when I zoom out again, honey, after your near-death experience, you could see the energy fields of everybody and you literally saw the toric field. Yeah. So the toric field is a movement of energy, okay? You can do it on Sally. Oh. Where this is you, okay? And what the Taurus does, or the toric field, and this isn't a belief system, Google it. The, the Taurus is an energetic movement of energy that's around apples, trees, anything alive, worlds universes galaxies is always a torus where the energy does and it does this it goes up like this it looks like an apple goes round and it goes up again both sides so i don't know if you can see that but there's this movement of energy that kind of does this 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 way yeah so if we live in a field of information, this is the symmetry. This is the movement of the field of energy humaning. It's coming from the bottom to the top up. It doesn't go down for your cognition to your body. Only about 10% of information actually goes from your brain to your body. Again, this is a very well-known fact within, yeah. within fields now. I know. So um, I... I... I read when I when I found Dr. Stephen Porges, he was talking about because I I think maybe some of some of the students on the year before I reached out to Dr. Porges, I would talk to them about the energy and there, that there were these I'd call them platforms of perspective. I think you guys remember that maybe, but I didn't know. I said like, there's a platform of perspective and it arises right here because I could see the physical energy. Oh, that's moose. Yeah, I think he's outside. Okay, <laughs> I did or the neighbor dog. Um, so I could see the physical energy when there was a stressful situation or somebody come that came to me and they were in distress, I could see their energy cycling more yes. here. And it was, a, it was a- Like lower down. Yeah. Yeah. Sub diaphragmatic, below the diaphragm. And so, um, and then I would, I would discuss the platform of perspective and we talk about I think sensations in the body, but but I called that the trauma exchange. And then I met, I reached out and I actually told Dr. Porges my story, like everything, my my dear near death, and that I could see energy. And he responded, and he's now my teacher. He's now my friend. He doesn't think I'm crazy. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so and he said that calling it perception is a dis disservice because it. Anytime we have the word perception, it's people look at it as a cognitive sort of cognitive bias. a cognitive. But yes, it's it, it's because we live in a cognitive centric world. We can't get away from it. So that's why he came up with the word neuroception. So perception, I said, but it actually means perceptio. You experience life with all of your senses and then some. He said, "Yes, that's that's the that's the root word." However, we live in a cognitive centric world. It's going to be seen as a as a, it's it, there's an intentionality. You're doing something wrong. Your 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 perception of that is is the reason it's causing you pain. So he came up with neuroception. And this is, again, this is your nervous systems, your entire body surveillance system below cognitive awareness. So because 
again, you know, perception and, and especially thought, that's what Rudy was trying to explain using that word. And I understand you can, you know, the, you can call that source all that is, you know, divine thought, but it's kind of getting jumbled and people are having the experience that they're doing something wrong. It gets really misunderstood. Yeah. And so that's why he came up with neuroception. It is your nervous system's heroic attempt to keep you safe. You are not doing anything wrong. You're not not getting it. it there's no intentionality behind it. Yeah. It just shows that you are this beautiful, beautiful, exquisite, divine human. We, we've we almost been going an hour, honey. So okay. Can I go one more? Yeah. Um, there's a link in the chat. Um, if we've got enough interest, we could go deeper in this, do a course on this, what like unpack it, because we're trying to do this quite quickly on a free webinar. <laughs> so yeah. um, there's a link. What I recommend that you do is if you're going to go, just click it before you go and register your interest, because then we can literally just send you what 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 we can do to, for you to go deeper into this. So um, what we what yeah, we talk about in holality is it's it's the holality of life when we honor the body honor the nervous system honor the the body as a as a filter perpetually transmuting this divine energy of life beautiful can you say that again if you can remember what you said it's the holality of life when we honor the body honor the nervous system that is a filter it is the link between the form and formless perpetually transmuting the energy of life beautiful i love that the body is perpetually transmuting the energy of life that's what i saw yes. yeah. that is what i saw and i saw i didn't i mean i was i was a nurse with a very i kind of had to throw my nursing book out the window and go with what i saw after my experience and so now it has this this experience this holality of life expresses let's say sally's experience let's just use sally so sally's experience i like to put it up here but i think for i'm going to put it up here so nature of consciousness sense of oneness sense of belonging sally's experiencing deficits in her body she's experiencing um, a sense of a disappearing self because of this chronic state of threat that she's carrying something is missing she doesn't see how she's wholly connected so nature of con consciousness is is our first module that's why we talk about it it is what could be described as the non-dual nature but it's all non-dual it's so she doesn't have a sense of connection. And then it expands over to the nature oops, of experience. So the nature of experience in everyday life. So Sally is moving forward with a heightened state of threat. She's moving forward. She doesn't understand what the sensations and impulses are going on in her body and why she can't have a relationship, why her relationships just don't seem to work or why maybe... she behaves in ways that she can't seem to control. Right. Yeah. And so it isn't about that. It's deeper. It's her nervous system is responding to keep her safe. She hasn't lost the intention. It's not her thinking. She really wants to be in a loving relationship, but her body is saying danger. Mm -hmm. And so that's the nature of experience. And then we have the nature of creation. You could call that the law of attraction when really there isn't really a law of attraction. It's nature. It's the law of vibration. Law of attraction is a subsidiary to that. So nature of or law, nature of creation. So if the energy of life is perpetually transmuting via the human body, and, and the heart is the magnetic pole mm -hmm. that creates creation or helps creation. But yet Sally's, the muscles around Sally's heart are closed. They're, they're locked. Her heart is now just a pumping machine. She has a sense that her neck, she doesn't sense anything from the neck down. So the nature of, the nature of creation, she's going to try and think all these thoughts, but her body again is speaking a different language. 
So there isn't a magnetic pull. There's a maybe an, a, a spark of energy via a thought, but the magnetic pull of the heart isn't there. There's two different energies coming off, one from the head, one from the body. Yeah, because it's, a, it's, it's like noise canceling head forms. Yeah, beautiful. It cancels itself out. And so that's that's what we talk about. <laughs> and also now the last one is energetic, nature. energetic, energetic nature of life. And you could call that uh, broadening your bandwidth of wholeception. Yeah, like intuition, intuition, expansion, metaphysical, being able to see my daughter, my daughter, Sophia, who's in the non-physical. So experiences like that. But if your body is constantly transmuting this this energy behind life your bandwidth of, of pullception that's rudy's word um post dr porges <laughs> your bandwidth of wholeception is is going to be kind of narrow and, and narrow isn't a bad thing it's that it's just that your bias is fine-tuned to keep you safe because fundamentally the these imprints these innocent imprints these are very human imprints the inevitability we all have them to one degree or the other you know um you can't you can't think your way out you have to go into the sensations and impulses of the body for change for thoughts to be different, you need to go to the root cause of the thinking. It's below cognition. It's in the imprint of the body. So Jules has had so many clients who felt that their head was separate, or actually didn't know that the head was separated from the body. And as they started to include the body, they started having deeper feelings that they hadn't had before. Yeah, They started to get more intuitive because... And uh, an implication of intuition is open heartedness. You sense you feel more. OK, so. It's a little bit like this. Here's one I prepared earlier. OK, there's one whole rainbow, one rainbow. OK, but when you look at the rainbow, the medium of the water split one hole into wavelengths of light. Now you have colors. This is a higher wavelength than that. Hence, you can see Clyde's. Now, when you look at our holanity, our wholeness of being, okay, you can't fit it through thought because it's bigger, okay? You have to embrace all of it and so if you've got those imprints, it's going to be having a very present effect on your nature of experience. OK, if we have these imprints, it's going to have the effect of you not feeling connected to this divine source. It's going to have, you're going to have feelings of unworthiness. You're not going to feel this divine love. If you've got these imprints, it's going to affect your ability to create, like you were saying, because you're going to be more your heart's going to be closed down. You're not doing anything wrong. This is a natural side effect. And from an intuitive perspective, when there's this, these imprints going on, your intuitive capacity is going to be reduced. And again, I have to say, and I'm banging on about this, you can't change your thinking or gain an insight into your cognition to release all of this. Because I know that I've tried. And working with people deeper to the causal factor of why they're thinking what they're thinking has has been incredible, isn't it? Yeah. Anyway. It, it disarms. So anything before we uh have you covered everything? Yeah. Done well, honey. That's just just that's an hour. That oh. you did great. Okay. Uh, there was lots of questions. And yeah, I think we should take a little break. Okay. And guys. then we'll come back and do a big QA. So what I want you to do is go off for five minutes, have a cup of tea. Um, if you've got questions, comments, agree, disagree, whatever it is, put it in the chat. And then we're, me and Jules are going to stay here and look at the chat because we haven't even looked at it yet. And then we can come back and spend as much time as we need to go over everything so you guys are a bit clearer on this. Okay. So um, 
thank you for being here with us. Um, stick around, give us your comments and questions, and then we'll go to the, the live Q&A in five minutes. All right, see you shortly. Okay, thank you guys and welcome back. We've got a number of questions um, and we have written them down as a general theme. So um, what we, we won't say who asked the question, we're just gonna talk kind of quite neutrally about it. Um, right, I wanna be really transparent with you guys. We have had maybe dozens of people who are following and I, again I don't want to use any names one name was mentioned that includes them but I won't say what the name was who've been following many 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 three principals elders and teachers who have come to us secretly and we've worked with them to overcome their trauma now I have I co-created the 3pmovies.com website ages ago, and I literally traveled around the world. I have personally, and I'm not being egotistical, seen more Three Principles transformations than anyone in the world, because I literally traveled the world for three years filming everybody. Um, and from knowing a few of them, many of them, there has been regressions going on, okay? Um, but it's not a three P thing. You can look at anything, any Ooh. understanding. Okay. Any understanding you're going to find that that is completely normal. So I'm not, but fundamentally we've got a lot of people coming to us secretly. And when we post things like we did a webinar, why trauma is not just a thought people are kind of frightened to be publicly agreeing with us or giving us a thumbs up on social media they contact us for every for every message we get that people can see we get about six messages personally to us because they don't want to be stand up to be seen to being different from things at the moment um so so the question is yes we get an awful lot of people from the three principles coming to us with trauma um but you wouldn't know because they they don't tell anybody. I want to read that, Jason Shears. You can read it because I um, can't see it. But same <laughs> thing happened to me for the last two years. They said, don't tell anyone. Yeah. So there's this whole underground thing of people contacting us invisibly because they don't want yeah. to stand up. And so that is indicative of their physiological state mm -hmm. of threat. So there's going to be a lot of uh, experience extended emotions arising, um, you know, fear-based emotions. And and it could, you could place it on anything, but really it's the physiological state that is arising in that present moment in their body. Yeah, so. the thought of standing up and being seen, possibly criticized, they 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 just don't want to do it. So they they just do it. Also, Azra, who's literally just left, she's taking holality into prisons and jails. And she spent, I don't know, about a decade sharing the principles in prisons and jails. And she's now saying, okay, I can finally work with a whole of them. And yeah. she's saying a lot of the trainers and the inmates were traumatized. She knows how to help them now. Yeah. From a, from a longer term embodied deeper way than she could possibly do before just just using cognition yeah. and again i'm not principles bashing because i love i mean i trained with sydney banks i love that it says you're fundamentally healthy within i love that it talks about our this divine connection we have with all things so there's things about the principles that are really beautiful and helpful to people there's other things what we're talking about here that just can be a little bit limited um, and so we're just trying to kind of expand that. Um, one of the questions was, can you fundamentally, can you fit this into the principles to help people with trauma? And I guess what I have to say is, is that, um, again, there's, yes, you can help people by pointing to their, to their universal entangled divine nature yes you can point people to that they have a health within them but the principles traditionally doesn't really work with the body at a sensation level not a feeling or thought-based level a sensation level and 
there isn't an explanation to how the body works with an experience. So you can't really teach the principles because it doesn't include this, right. if it's, you see what I mean. It's more cognitive centric top down and it's a top down constraint. It It is trying to figure things out using a top down method, which um, doesn't offer a healing space to the whole of you. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that Dr. Stephen Porges is doing with everybody that's now on his board, like Bessel van der Kock is on his board, Dr. Peter Levine's on his board, Dr. Gabor Mate is one of his best friends on his board. Um, some other really amazing people using this bottom up uh, philosophy, they took it to Oxford. Mm -hmm. So, and so they took it to the, to the very cognitive centric, uh, um, paradigm, I guess. Yeah. Uh, professors at Oxford. And I was so excited. So it, 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 gi it gives me a space to be courageous. It gives me a space to do webinars like this. Cause I know, um, Dr. Porges was saying that a lot of people said, are you sure that you want to do this? <laughs> he said, yes, he did. So he, he took this and they're going to start implementing this in um, the curriculum at Oxford and at Cambridge. So I would guess five years down the road, the PhDs and the MDs will have more of a wholeness in their um, in their practice, in their way of healing. Yeah, and I've just posted a link in the chat. We interviewed Dr. Porges, I don't know, about a month ago. Um, that is the link to the interview that we did with Dr. Porges in the chat there. Um, do you want to? I'll read that while you're talking. Um, yeah, read, yeah, you want I, me to read it out? Or? Yeah, we can. We can ask. We can answer that one. Sorry, because that's where my brain. Um, I find the principles basically tell us that we only know about our feelings because of thought. Right. Because we have a brain, we are able to feel things, but that can get in the way of me actually feeling the feeling. It gets too cognitive. Yeah. So yeah, beauty actually gets my feeling, the feeling. Right, right. Yeah. That's why we, we use the word sen yeah. sensing. We have sensations all over our body, and um, the sensations and impulses are information and language that is subtly speaking to us. And then our cognition, our brain, tries to piece it together, and that's where we get that printout. You know, mm -hmm. whatever's going on. And at times in a heightened state of threat, our higher cortical logical brain is offline because all, all of the energy, all of the um, energy, the information, the, the goal is to get you up and going before thought, lightning speed. But when there isn't a place to run and there isn't something to run from, that's when we have that physical um, pain, the backache, the exhaustion. Yeah, when I, so when Jules basically took me through a pain I've been having in my solar plexus, for as long as I can remember, just this sensation. Um, when I, I mean, that's for another webinar, but when there's this communion there, an open-handed loving awareness, um, there was this integration and my back pain went. Oh, yeah. So I don't have this this lifelong back pain that I've always had. And I'm not saying it's going to do that for you. Right. I'm just saying that when you work at the sensation below thought, below feeling and emotion to the sensation level, um, you're literally going to the root, the root mm -hmm. of what's going on. Um, we We don't have enough really time to go over that, but we we work with our students to so that they can uncover their own somatic literacy so that they can uncover a language it's a communication it's a dialogue and this 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 polarity is a spiritual bio psychological approach the mm -hmm. trauma in the body is just a wound it's a physiological state. It can be healed. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You are, it sometimes just gets stuck, never, ever broken. It gets stuck and it 
inspires. And when we try to approach that at a cognitive level, like it's our thinking causing this, there is that, um, what is Dan, Dr. Dan Siegel? He calls it the top, top down constraint. You can't really communicate with the body on an intellectual level. You, you need to uncover your own somatic literacy, which we do, and speak to it yeah. in that manner. Yeah. That was answering that one question. Okay, so you had a question about... Um... We had a couple of questions about, well, okay, so how do you, how do you heal? But maybe you could answer the first one. How, you know, how did you, from your, how did your spiritual experience heal you from, name some of the labels you had. Oh, quite everything. Name some of them. And even one I was hiding. Apart so. from the physiological. <laughs> yeah, I know. Effects. Yeah. So I had um 80, well, I was complex PTSD, chronic PTSD um ADHD depression anxiety um uh what is oh I'm so sorry what's that exhaustion one um P, P, um burnout no um chronic fatigue chronic fatigue okay and then that's when I kind of got nervous and I thought I'm gonna stop going to them because they're gonna put this other label on me and anyway I had all the medication and everything to go along with it and I was spiraling downwards because I had this, this belief or this, this experience that I was broken and that coupled with my it, it, physiological expression in that time, I downsized, downsized in my work, in my home. Um, I, I found it difficult to take care of my son who was very hyperactive and I was living in my car. And then when I was living in my car at a campground in the corner, <laughs> all places, <laughs> um, <laughs> the state came and took, mm -hmm. took my son. And I, so they took him and everything. This is why I call it my forever present ground zero. Everything that was arising in my physical body and my physiology that I was pushing down unintentionally, not knowing, because I know if the doctors and the psychiatrists and the psychologists knew this, that they could have helped me. But with the information they were given via their educa education, <laughs> they couldn't. And I know something, Dr. Porter, he's so kind. He says, it's not that they didn't want to help you. It's that they didn't have the, the, the knowledge to help you. And so I had a sudden cardiac arrest. Everything in my body tightened up and I turned towards, like I, I turned towards everything, everything that was arising, all of this, this horrible things that I was broken, that I was damaged, that I was worthless, that I was all of that. But I turned towards that and fell to the ground and I fell to the ground, but I kept going. I stopped at the ground. I fell into myself and into this blue black expansive state that I'd like to say well, it, it, it was the void. It was everything that ever was and ever will be. Everything mm -hmm. made sense in that moment. Everything that ever was and ever will be was there. And then it began to move and polarize and express up as expressions, as birds, as trees, as humans. And that is when I knew I was fearing this gift of this human experience. I was fearing the contrasts that are necessary for life. I was fearing every bodily sensation that is a gift. I call it this non-dualistic sublime love. It is love having a human experience that contracts and expands. And sometimes there's grit and sometimes there's a sense of bliss, but it is in that wholeness. And I woke up from the ground 
and I could see energy all over, all over my car, the rocks, the trees, and even in myself. And I could see an energy. The torque field. The torque field. Yeah. And so turning to, I knew then to honor each physical sensation that was arising in my body and honor it. And, and it was, I don't know. It wasn't until 2016 when I got to, sorry if this is so long, you guys, um, when I got to Hawaii, that I started really physically, I was trying to get my son back. And that's when I experienced this visceral pain. It was a physical expression experience going on in my body. I would be driving down the road and something via neuroception, I now know, would trigger something that was being held in my body and I turned towards it. Yeah. I turned towards it and I honored it. And I went back home and it was physically painful, but I had to turn towards it and express the energy out because I could see the energy when I had the physical pain. The energy was lower. It wasn't harmonizing as it was when I had the sensation of, of, of a more expansive feeling. I don't know if I'm making sense. Well, I'm I, not making sense. No, you are. I, I think what it is, is so Jules had a need of experience or oneness experience or expansion of consciousness. There's lots of words you would have put in it. And then all of your symptoms, your physiological symptoms disappeared. Mm -hmm. Your enlarged heart shrunk oh, yeah. back to normal again. Yeah. All your mental labels were gone. Like it was just, and you got younger. There's a picture of Jules on her ID card. And then a new one, and she was 10 years older in this one. She looked younger than that one from before the experience. So there was this huge transformation. Now, the reason I'm saying that is because, so you're in a state of bliss well, within the ups and the downs. Within the ups okay. and the downs, and that's it. Honoring, honoring our human expression. One wasn't good, one wasn't bad. Expansive wasn't good and contraction wasn't bad. Yeah. It is all part of being wholly holy human yes and we ebb and flow and contract and expand just as nature does just as it's it's i don't even call it i told dr Schwartz, i don't like the word homeostasis <laughs> because stasis means still mm -hmm. it's harmonic movement it's harmonic movement throughout your body and honoring that and so and now i know the reason why I can't articulate it is because it's inarticulate. It's something that we work with our students and they develop their own somatic literacy. They come up with their own language of the body. It is the implicit somatic before cognition. So there's not going to be a clear language. All I know is, is what I did. But I can't really articulate it. Rudy's amazing with it. Well, though. you so you had that experience, and then you found Dr. Porges, and he explained it scientifically. And there is yes. there's like I know how many four hundred research basically like four hundred peer reviewed research journals saying what we're saying here about the body. Right. Um, and I put a link in the chat of the interview we did with Dr. Porges, so have a look at that. But my point is, so he had that big awakening or whatever you want to call it, but. The essence that calls itself jewels is within the boundaries of this jewels right. time, space and matter body. OK. And then when we got together in a relationship. Okay, With even more. So, yes. So your your imprint and my imprint. So I want to say it offered a Rissy space. Relationships out. offer a space for even more grit. So the space, my daughter transitioned about six months after my experience. And I'm so great for that experience prior to that mm. and and i'm so grateful because well first of all i knew exactly where she was yes <laughs> you've been there so it was cool she was in the space that i just left <laughs> but secondly i know what it's like to not see that and yes. so her beautiful friends and my uh, my ex mother in law, her mother, her grandmother was was so physically 
traumatizing, having so much pain. And she was going through a state of threat. And then when that gets so overwhelming, um, she just exhausts it, it's, it's exhausting and she fainted. And so she was going through this. She was going throughout the day, the day that Sophia was in her accident. And so I'm so honored that I was able to, to help people from a space of compassion. And the compassion, I want to say, is an emergent property. It comes with understanding the depths of your own soul, understanding the depths of your own whole being, all the grittiness and the ickiness that arises. If you can understand that and go to a place where you have a full-bodied sense that you exist, you can begin to love yourself. You can't just love yourself. You have to understand the depths of your own soul. And then that births compassion. And that answers, I'm just going through the questions. So that, in a sense, someone asked about, well, how, how do you heal? So. You turn towards it. You're, okay, so my opinion is if you try and transcend the human experience try and lift above it rise above it or you just want to be in your true nature um you can have beautiful expanded experiences but you're going to come down to being human because there's a human body involved here you know there's imprints involved now having an imprint doesn't mean you're broken everyone has imprints mm -hmm. every single human being is an energy field humaning and there's information in the energy field you can have an imprint of the birth of your child. That's not, that doesn't break you. It's not a bad imprint. When you get rid of good and bad imprintation, you realize we're energy humaning, we're energy physicaling, and we're a field of information that moves in the toric field. Okay. So when you look at unpleasant experiences imprinted, when you really see the nature that you don't feel like you're broken, like, oh, this is my humanness. Yeah. And well, with it's all humanness. With the wholeness, mm -hmm. there's a specific way that you can, with loving awareness, commune and integrate all of it. I'm not saying you need to dig up your past hurts. No. I'm not saying you have to think your way out of it. I'm not saying that you have to re traumatize yourself by going back to the past. I'm not saying that, okay? What I am saying is in this present moment, you presently go within with loving awareness and your body will tell you that what you could call the sen via sensations and you start a communi communion with that. Now, what I have to say is that this can be a gritty process and I wouldn't recommend doing this by yourself without any support. For instance, with our students, often Jules would have a one-to-one -one with someone and they'll do it in real time. So Jules can be there with them and it may take however long it takes. Normally you have tremendous results within four, four, four sessions. Yeah. And we've got just heaps of testimonials of people talking about that. So we're not just making it up. We're just really saying that we all have imprintations because we're energy humaning. And when you don't include the body, the nervous system, our whole beingness in experience, you're literally breaking God in half. There's huge swathes of us that go unnoticed, that get vilified. It's my false self. It's, it's my ego. It's my dark side. And unconditional love is unconditionally embracing all of it. All of it. All of it. And that's, um, so yeah, all of it. Like you, we still have neuro grooves. We're never going to get rid of our neuro grooves because we're physical beings, but we understand and we have a different perspective and we honor what's arising. So it isn't going to control us. So it is because there's something here about, to the point where it becomes like a broken bone. Oh, yes, yes, that's, so yes. So that's that's the neural groove. So there's always gonna be a neural groove, a sensitivity. There's a sensitivity around um, like 
just it's it's hard to put a language to it but there's a sensitivity in my body and my physical being and i know what it's um what its neuroceptive receiver is is telling me that's the only way i can explain it it's it, the neuro groups that are always there yeah. it's kind of like a scarring i use an avocado if mm -hmm. you put if you kind of slice the avocado and the avocado peel there's going to be ripples if the avocado is going to heal, we have scars on our body. It doesn't mean we're broken. It means we're biochemical, electromagnetic, plasma-like beings. I mean, we are these just, yeah, these amazing creatures, but we're human. I'm going to read out Julian's message for the guys who's going to watch the recording. Um, there's so many messages. Um, Julian, it's true. I I've studied trauma with Rudy and Jules. I had a traumatic experience where I nearly died from suffocating as a six month old. Again, bearing in mind at six months, you don't have the higher cortical function developed yet. Um, I had to be revived by a medical team. I put it together that this was caused me to suffer from claustrophobia, not liking crowds or confined spaces. This experience was before my brain was sufficiently developed to cognitively remember the event. And indeed I had no memory. My mother told me about it. However, my nervous system, the polyvagal system, was fully operational as this starts very early on as we develop in our mother's womb. This means I remembered the experience somatically in my body, but not as a memory and not as a thought. My understanding of 3P could not help me overcome this problem, but Holanti has because we can commune with the sensations and give ourselves new cues of safety which rewise the polyvagal nervous system yeah beautiful so um, yeah so poly the po as dr porges said polyvagal is just a framework it's just a framework that solidifies and supports what your you know holality what you're teaching he says i'm not a therapist <laughs> i'm a scientist <laughs> and so his scientific research offers structure and grounding of what it means to be wholly human. Yeah. And so yeah, spiritual being, beings. One of the questions, do you work specifically with certain pains? Um, generally, Jules does this work. And um, I would say from that you don't literally focus on a specific mm -hmm. problem in the body. There's this overarching understanding when the nervous system feels safe a lot, not all, because we can't guarantee anything here, but a lot of these yeah. physiological effects start clearing up by themselves. Yeah. Would you say that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You take care of the nervous system and the body tends to take care of itself. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that is all the questions. Um yeah, I think that's all the questions that I know of. Um, lovely discussion. We're getting lots of thank yous and well dones and they're so grateful and um, all of that malarkey, which is lovely. We appreciate it. So let's let's wrap up, honey, because it's, okay. it's been a while. Um, OK, so. Um, so again, this is a spiritual bio psychological approach. Holality is. You are these amazing divine spiritual beings that can never be broken, but you experience the world through your beautiful gift of a human body. And we we, we get scared of that. Um, I'm going to put that link in the chat. If you want to go deeper, learn more, get help, whatever you want to do, um, there's a link. Oh, I've just directed messages. <laughs> Here we go. There's a drink for you. Uh, <laughs> There. There, there's the link so click that register um when is your next training after january oh this of course um oh, hang on i'll put this link in yeah so here's, here's the link to the facilitator training because we've just been asked for it um and part of the facilitator training because not everyone's into this and not everybody does it but if you wanted Jules works with you on a one-to-one -one yeah. to kind of develop the somatic literacy and what I need integrate. To, what I need to explain is our facilitators have to go within themselves. They have to, to develop their own somatic literacy via the language of the body and honor their whole humanness because that's what's, that, what, ugh, that is what makes a freaking phenomenal facilitator. 
Yeah. Like that is because you understand the depths and the pain of your own being right now, right here in this present moment, you can hold space for others just that much more. So my summation and have a think about your summation, honey, um, is the thing that started me in all this is when I was 20, I had what you would call a oneness experience. Okay. And within that experience, if I could put a word, which is, which you can't, but I'm going to try to, I feel it, I, I experienced or I became a love, a universe, multiverse, expanding love. And again, I'm tired now and I can't really put it into words, but it was just this benign divine love. Now, with our wholeness, when you really embrace all of you, the sharp pointy bits, the rough bits, the, the dark edges, like this is unconditional love. It's not in transcending anything. It's not vilifying these parts of ourselves. It's not in ignoring parts of ourselves. It's in loving all of us. That is the word. Unconditionality isn't transcending anything. It isn't being positive all the time. It isn't being in our true nature. It isn't in a particular state of beingness. Unconditional compassion is unconditionally embracing every single molecule of the expression that is you, humaning. Until you do that, you will never find a deep, wholesome, prolonged, love because there's parts of you screaming for attention you can never wholly work with other people because you haven't done your own stuff holy the w holy so i know that's a little bit extreme but i just kind of have to say that am i doing that am i wholly working with people no but I'm much I'm doing it much more now that I'm embracing my own wholeness. And I have to put that largely down to having a wife that continually kicks my ass on a daily basis. Every good man needs an ass kicking wife and every good wife needs an ass kicking man. That's my moral of the. Yeah. Thing. Um, yeah. Rudy got me to talk. <laughs> I was so scared. I was like, every time before these webinars, I was like, I can't sleep. I'm up at two in the morning, but I kind of embraced it like last night navigated it yeah like it's yeah I've been so humbled I was so certain of what I taught and mm -hmm. then I tell you what I mean uncertainty is the doorway to deeper presence I mean certainty isn't when you're certain you're blind as a down and you are blocked there's this constantly being foolish this constant I don't know this this constant uncertainty and it allows this room for something else to come through. And it's just so frighteningly beautiful. That just um, shows your beauty, Rudy. Um, a few people saying they'd like to chat with you. So um, if you want to chat with Jules or me or Heather, please go to that link. So we've got your email address because we're not going to know is you're coming from a list of about 1200 people. Um, was if you click, where is it? This link, we're just going to get the names of the people specifically on this training and we'll be able to find you. How do I know who wants to talk about it? We can look at the chat afterwards. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so okay. click that link, put in your name and then we'll be able to find you. Um, yes. So there, there are spaces left for the facilitator training. And what we can do is... Um, we can extend the early bird. Yeah. Yeah. We can um, let you know about that. So that's Mark. So yeah, Mark, put your name in the thing I just put and then we'll find you and then we can email you personally. Okay. So one other summation while you think of what to say to end it. Um, oh, I'm going to sound like the Beatles. To me, it's about love. Everything else is like just, um, whole love, all of you. Yeah. 
all of everybody else. I'm not trying to be a guru or kill the guru, kill your coach. <laughs> Try not to get found out by the police. No, I'm only joking. Go within yourself. You are your guru. You are your guru. All the answers are within you. Don't bypass it onto some other charismatic leader. Ooh. Don't bypass it onto me and Jules, like whoever you like. Go within yourself. Yes. All the information of the universe is already within you. Just these, these like Elise and Julian and Steve, and I, that's all I can see right now. These beautiful humans like had to put up with me and I can be kind of a hard nose when they're not honoring their unique expression going within and honoring that not what somebody else says out there but unique expression that's what I saw there is a uniqueness for a reason the uniqueness offers contrast. Contrast offers experience. There would be no freaking human experience if there was no contrast. I'm so sorry. I swore, sort of. But but I there would be no contrast. And so honor that. Honor that. I call it a non-dualistic sublime love. Non-dualistic in the way that it's all one. I'm going to use my hand. Expressing everything that ever was and ever will be. But it's assimilated. There's no experience. So it begins to express. And in that expression, in that contrast, it births this beautiful experience. So we Sorry, love you. Thanks. We hope that you've had a nice experience. I know this is a bit belief busting and I know this can be controversial what we're saying here. I know this is new for many of you as it was for me. So yeah if you're interested re-watch the recording because there's a lot in here um and until then oh next webinar tuesday next week oh, we've yeah. been looking at the power of two the power that two people have energetically we're going to really expand and i am not joking the power of two people in the harmonic resonance can literally not metaphorically but literally bend space time without taking drugs right. naturally organically via the vibration so this is around like the energetic nature that we're going to be talking about this is more like the nature of experience we're going to be going deep into the energetic nature on the next webinar cool okay guys can i can i just have a round of applause for jules please <laughs> come on well done baby you were so nervous trying to trying to do this in like 50 minutes like what you've covered it was, it was just beautiful well, rudy kicked my butt a lot because oh, i was so oh, scared but... i was really nervous i know you want to stay to threat you mean? yes i was in a heightened <laughs> state of threat yes. <laughs> okay yeah. um we love all of you um we look forward to seeing the webinars um god bless you and we'll see you very soon no. Thanks, Hugs. Thanks, guys. Thank oh, you. Thank you. <laughs>